Well, thanks for all for coming. Um, we're pretty excited today to have the Northwest Basket Weavers uh, Vibe Phillips Guild with us to learn some about baskets. And I know just from some of you that I know from the Whatcom County Library System, like Shannon has taught willow baskets for us many times and we miss her and we can't wait till we get back to live programming. But for today we have this. So um, the Guild, the Northwest Basket Weavers Guild was established in 1982 and its purpose is to preserve and promote the art of basket making. So we're gonna learn a lot about that today and we're gonna start with Vicki Nicholson. And you can put your questions in chat. Um, I will try to uh, keep track of those. And if you have questions for any of the pre presenters that we'll be talking today, just put your question there and we'll ask them. So here we go. Thank you. Hello, my name is Vicki Nicholson and uh, I've been a member of the Northwest Basket Weavers Guild for over 20 years, and um, I just finished up my term as president. So I thank you all for joining us today, and especially to Anne uh, from the Wat Whatcom County Library for hosting us today. And um, we have a seasoned panel of four basket makers here that uh, are going to educate you on the styles of basketry. Um, we want to encourage you to try basketry in the future. So briefly, we'll touch upon many paths you can take, um, many paths that we can lead you down. So there are, you know, both traditional, utilitarian, and contemporary baskets. Basketry has been around since mankind. Just recently, they uncovered an eight thousand six hundred year old basket um, down in Cowboy Cave of Utah. After my talk here, I'll uh, put that uh, email ad or the uh, link in the chats so you can go and review that. Uh, so that's that's very, very interesting, especially to us uh, basket weavers. And so now I am going to turn the presentation over to Jill Green. She'll talk a little bit about our guild and um, then she'll move right into her presentation. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Jill Green. I made my first basket about 45 years ago um, and I joined the guild in about 1983. I make both traditional and contemporary baskets. The Northwest Basket Weavers Vi Phillips Guild started in the early 1980s with 16 women who were traditional basket makers. They met in the home of Vi Phillips on Whidbey Island on a regular basis and formalized their group into the guild in 1982. From this group, we have grown to be over 200 members in 11 states and four, four provinces in Canada. We took the name of Vi Phillips because she was the first teacher who had, and she had a great fascination, curiosity, and passion for all kinds of traditional baskets. These attributes have continued in our membership today and now include contemporary baskets as well as traditional ones. You will see later that anything goes in basketry today. I like to think that basketry is inclusive, diverse, and universal. The picture you see is of um, Ed Carrier. I should go back. Before I go further, I want to recognize the Whatcom Museum for hosting the National Basketry Exhibit, Revi Rooted, Revived, and Reinvented Basketry in America. It was, it was in Whatcom um, Museum exactly three years ago. I hope that some of you saw this amazing exhibit. Our guild helped to organize and participated in some of the special activities that happened. I think I probably came up to Bellingham 10 times during the period that it was on show. It was a wonderful ex experience and I love my memories of it and I'm so grateful to the Vodka Museum. Okay, now what you're seeing, picture of Ed Carrier. Um, he is one of our honorary members and he's of the Suquamish tribe. Uh, he lives in Indianola and he's working on a traditional clam basket and you can see plating um, he's just finished that's underneath his hand. Um, and that's the bottom of the basket. He won't continue plating when he goes up, he'll do an open weave 
because it'll be a clam basket. Plated basket is my, basketry is my topic today. Plating is one of the four techniques of weaving that can be found throughout the world. Plated baskets and mats are made with flexible materials that vary in width or flat and ribbon-like, such as plants and leaves, palms, grasses, split rattans, bamboo, cattails, leaves, tree bark, like cedar bark, birch bark, willow bark, um, also man-made materials like paper and plastic. The materials that basket makers from around the world uh, that use are dependent upon what is available or what grows in their area. There's always processing involved with these materials, drying, soaking, cutting, dyeing, scraping, splitting, smoothing. Sometimes preparation takes longer than weaving. Uses of plated baskets include harvesting, storing, and transportation. There are fish and animal insect traps and cages, attire such as shoes, hats, and more. I have on a hat that's from Borneo and it's plated. They're plated furniture like chair seats and mats, plated dolls. Very large industrial farm containers are usually made from bamboo. Food harvesting, prep and storage, bamboo steamers, strainers, containers to dry and store food and gathering baskets. And then there are the art objects, such as the exquisite Japanese bamboo baskets and ikebana baskets. And I'll show you some uh, special paper made baskets towards the end. And, and also finger traps. I think everybody has seen these before. And what you see up there is Admiral Akbar, and he's saying, it's a trap. When you put your fingers in both ends and you pull them apart, you get trapped. But to get out, you have to push your fingers together. Next photo, please. The simplest way to describe plating is that it involves laying out two sets of elements or strips, one at right angles to the other, interlacing them so that each strip passes over one, under one, or under over one and under one. Remember the potholders that you made when you were a kid was weaving in and out over one, under one. Unlike other weaving techniques in basketry, plating does not have weavers and spokes. The plant that you see here with long flat wide leaves is New Zealand flax and it's, it's a common basketry material. The start of the plated pouch is just below it. Next to the plant is the progression of weaving going up the sides. Below is the finished pouch. One advantage of plating is that it can be done quickly once, once the material is gathered and prepared. So it probably took less than an hour to make that basket. Um, next one, please. These are varieties of plating. So I'll just start over on the, the left side. Plate, plain plating is just like what you saw over one under one. It's like a checkerboard. Twill are the overs and unders that are more than one. So it, it can be over two, over three, under one, over three. There's a whole sequence you can do. And it's, um, it's amazing how many different patterns you can pull out of that. The, the twill weaving is the most variation. Below that is diagonal twill or bias twill. And it's like the regular twill above, but it's turned 45 degrees. Over on the right side, mad weave or triaxial weave is the most difficult and it's the most challenging for me. Um, the elements are woven in three directions and it's, it's pretty hard. And I've heard that they used to force the women prisoners in Singapore to do mad weave. I don't know how true that is, but I've read it a couple different places. Below um, is open hexagonal weave. It's three directions, but there's open spaces. Um, and it's, uh, it goes pretty fast too. I can do that one a little bit better than the mad weave. Next photo. These are two examples of plated cedar bark pouches. I, I made both of these. The one on the left is diagonal twill plating. You see how it's on the bias. And the one on the right is just plain or checker weaving. Um, both are closed spacing. In other words, you can't see through. Uh, next photo. These are hexagonal open weave baskets. 
the first one is a shaker cheese basket. And what they would do is they would line that basket with um, a piece of material and then they would plop the, the cheese material into it and let it drain. Let, let the, the, and then it would leave the curds and they would have their cheese. The open hexagonal plate baskets on the truck are strong enough to hold pigs. And there you see a pig with his snout sticking out. Then the boat is called a coracle and these are found in Asia and in um, Ireland. And you see the open weave, but there's two layers. There's another layer of, of either weaving or some kind of a, a fabric underneath it or a skin underneath it so that it doesn't leak. Next photo, please. These are examples of very advanced techniques of diagonal twill weaving, plating. The three in the upper left corner are the Louisiana Chittimacha baskets and they're made of river cane and they are really beautiful. I've seen a set of nested baskets that were made like this. There was probably 15 of them starting at a large size and going down to really small. The one on the right is a, a wedding basket from Borneo and it's made of rattan. Similar design, but in different parts of the world. When the Chittimaca basket makers saw the Borneo basket, they said, they copied me, but couldn't have been. Things happen in different places of the world of similar designs, it's amazing. The bottom photo is a bunch of backpacks from Borneo. You can see a lot of variation in the designs. And this is what you can do with twill weaving. The complicated designs when the twill varies from over or under one up to over or under six elements. Okay, next one, what's next? Oh yeah, these are the birch bark baskets and this is the, the attire. Um, over here, uh, the man and the woman, the man is Vladimir Yarish and he's from Russia. And he has come over here and taught several times. Um, next to him is Dorothy Gill Barnes uh, who passed recently and she's got a pair of his boots on and she was really having a good time. She was almost dancing in those boots. Um, next to them are um, uh, a bunch of shoes. And then this guy over here that looks a little grumpy, um, he's got a whole outfit on. I don't know if it's uncomfortable or what, but I thought that was kind of an amusing and an interesting outfit. And then the boots are, are from our own Lisa Telford. She's high up and um, she has made several different kinds of shoes uh, out of cedar bark. And these are plated. Um, I don't, these may be at the Burke Museum. I can't remember for sure. Okay, next one. Okay, this is Sean Gosharn. And she, um, she was born in 1957 and she died in 2018. Um, she was of the Eastern Band Cherokee tribe. She spent significant amounts of time digging around in archives of materials related to Native American issues to inform her art. Using splints made from paper, copies of the treaties, photographs, Native American memoirs, and oral histories and other primary sources that she unearthed, she created double woven baskets primarily in traditional Cherokee forms. Her work has a dual goal to untangle Native American identity from stereotypes that have been historically perpetuated and to create a conversation around the ways in which historical treatment of indigenous people informs and affects contemporary conversations around native baskets. You can learn more about her at her website that's listed there. So what you see there um, are some pictures, but if you could look really closely, maybe the next picture will show us better. Um, you can see inside the basket, there's print on the paper. And sometimes the print is um, from broken treaties that she copied onto the paper. These three baskets are, are made of paper and they have um, printing on the inside. Her art incorporated political activism, such as phrases of broken treaties. 
if, yeah, you know, I think you can see the printing inside. Um, this is twill plating. There are three wires. These are the three wires who traveled to England in 1762 to meet King George. And they were thought to be royalty by the British people. Next photo. This is our own Dorothy McGinnis who lives in Everett. She's in a class all by herself. She paints watercolor paper and then she cuts the paper on a pasta machine to get uniform sized widths. Her technique is over three under three diagonal twill plating. She weaves baskets and complicated three dimensional geometric pieces. She's the only person that I know who does this and we'll, we never know what, what she's gonna be doing next. And I think there's one more. Yep, this is Dorothy again, and she she's very accomplished with Mad Weave. And again, they're made out of painted paper. They're in three directions. And she has amazing control that she can get shapes like this. This is a very di difficult technique and her mastery of it amazes me again and again. And one more, happy pie day, it's coming up. Thank you. Next screen, please. Next one, Richard. Oh, there we go. Hi, I'm Vicki again. Welcome back to my, to my presentation here. Um, the basket that you're seeing now is uh, made of uh, glycerin treated pine needles. The sewing thread is artificial sinew and it has a cedar uh, laser cut disc in the middle there. This is the basket that we um, use for beginners at our coiling convergence event that started in uh, 2017. Myself and uh, Barbara Osborne are the co-founders of the coiling convergence and it usually happens annually um, pre-COVID in Kent, Washington in April. Uh, hopefully in 2022, you'll be able to come join us and uh, take a class there. If you need to uh, have any questions about any of this, you can always email me. I'm uh, pinebasket at aol.com. Next slide, please, Richard. This uh, basket here is made from uh, Western red cedar bark, and it also has um, yellow cedar that is twined in between the cedar spokes. Next. Okay, so we are um, gathering cedar bark here. It's it's coming up to the season to be gathering cedar bark, usually in the spring. And there's some little hints around that show when it's time to go out in the woods and gather your cedar bark. Uh, as the sap starts rising, you can watch for the salmon berries to start coming upon the, the bushes or the blooming of the scotch broom. There's usually a good indication that the um, cedar bark is um, almost ready. So here, um, the Western red cedar tree is actually known to many as the tree of life. And after the bark is collected from the tree, it's uh, the tree is classified as a culturally modified tree. The bark was traditionally shredded, woven, and made into clothing, mats, and baskets. Cedar bark is water resistant and resilient. Prior to going into the woods to gather your cedar bark, you must obtain a gathering permit from a ranger station. You can go to fs.usda.gov. Once again, I'll include these in the uh, chat after my um, presentation. You can gather up to 25 strips of cedar bark per year. And some of these strips of cedar bark that you see can get up to 27 feet long. Gathering um, the cedar bark and then 
you actually do a little bit of the preparation in the woods. So we are actually removing the outer bark from the inner bark or the cambium layer, layer, which is what we are using to strip down and make into baskets or um, whatever, mats, uh, as you've seen the boots that Lisa Telford made. And so we um, leave the outer bark in the forest and then the inner bark is rolled up. And then that is what we take with us to um, as we gather. The cedar bark does need to be dried so it does not get moldy or um, have little bugs in your in your work. We don't want that. So generally the rule of thumb is to let it dry air, uh, by air uh, for up to a year. Some use it sooner but um, one year is generally what is recommended. You can also watch for um, some place where they're going to be logging, which is a really good way to um, gather cedar bark, is that way you can take all this, the bark off of one tree. Otherwise, for the living tree, only one strip per tree, generally on the north side, so it doesn't uh, affect the growing of the tree. Okay, Richard, the next slide, please. So on the upper left here, there's a strip of cedar bark. It's already been ran through um, a, what we call a jerry stripper. And this strips the uh, cedar bark into even strips of about a quarter of an inch. Or if you need it larger, there are different settings on the uh, jerry stripper that you can also utilize. And what I'm doing here is I'm separating those strips into the, um, well, to the, Okay, I lost my train of thought until the dimension. So you can, uh, for the width that you want and or, or the thickness, sorry about that. And then on the lower left here, um, these are actually cedar tree roots. And so we, you know, they like to utilize the whole tree. So these roots, you do need a harvesting permit also, and they are just dug from the ground. And once again, you want to be respectful of the tree and only gather a few roots from each tree so we aren't doing any damage to the tree. And the basket here on the right is um, rest, Western Red Cedar, and it has been, and the red is dyed with uh, red dye. Next question, or next one, please. Okay, and this one is uh, cedar bark spokes, and I have twined over them um, using sweet grass, uh, which is kind of a nickname here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it is uh, actually a sedge, and we gather those in the loomy uh, saltwater marsh areas. And once again, you do probably need to watch for um, private property signs and a harvesting permit may also be required for that. To gather the sweet grass, that's usually gathered um, July, August, somewhere right, right around that time frame. And then also the sweet grass is hung up to dry also, as it does shrink a bit when, when it's in its drying process. And so you don't want, um, uh, it's shrinking after you've uh, twined it into your basket and have sloppy stitches. Next one, Richard. Okay, and then this one, um, I went to Seldovia, Alaska with my good friend, Karen Sherwood, and we took a class from an Athabascan native lady, Audrey Armstrong, and we learned the ancient tradition of fish skin basketry. It's uh, done more with a sewing technique. And the next frame, please, Richard. So first of all, you um, catch your fish, which uh, my son there is our family fisherman, and he's caught a king salmon there. On the upper right, here I am preparing the fish skin. You have to get all the flesh or the meat off of the skin. And what I'm using there is a traditional tool by Alaskans. It's called the ulu. And I am scraping and scraping and scraping to get all that meat off of the, um, off the skin. 
And then you um, cut, the pa uh, cut a pattern out of the skin to form over um, your chosen mold. And then on the lower right, I've got my um, pieces cut out and I am sewing them together. I have the right sides of the salmon together, just as if you were sewing uh, with materials. And the thread that I am using is uh, artificial sinew. Artificial sinew is extremely durable and you really have to actually cut it with scissors to get it to break. To do the sewing process, I'm using a glover's needle, which is also used on leather. It has a little tri-tip on the needle there that helps penetrate that tough, durable fish skin. It is just amazing how strong that skin is. Uh, traditionally, the native uh, Athabascan would have used these baskets for um, food storage. Okay, the next slide, please. So on the upper left, once again, is the king salmon basket. And I have used a little uh, daylily cordage there and embellished them with some Swidorsky crystals. On the lower right is a fish skin basket made out of halibut. So it's not strictly used with salmon skin. There's all kinds of different fish skins that you can utilize. Um, the white that you see, the skin is from the belly of the halibut. And the black side is the, the black is the back side of the halibut. And once again, these are um, dried around forms. So they create their shape and then the form is removed. So the curing uh, process of the um, skin can take up to about seven days and it's cured in alcohol base. And then it is washed and washed and washed and sewn and then shaped around the mold and let to dry. What does the form look like and made from? Well, you can take a good, a little trip to the dollar store and find some of them, little plastic uh, container or actually the king salmon basket I did around an oatmeal box. So you can just be creative there. Thanks for that question. Okay, next slide, please, Richard. So we, Karen and I needed to take our uh, fish skin class um, knowledge and um, apply it to what, what we do too, also in our heritage and our basket making. So Karen Sherwood developed the pattern on the upper left. And what that is, uh, is strips of salmon skin, and it is woven in between cedar strips. And the bottom part of it is twined with sweetgrass, and above the salmon strips is also sweetgrass. I really had a lot of fun making that basket. And my forte is pine needle basket tree. So on the lower right, I had to incorporate some fish skin into my pine needle baskets. And so these are um, treated pine needles. They've been dyed black with um, writ dye and a little bit of glycerin in a, in a bath. And then the white that you see is strips of the halibut belly. And then my coil began around a halibut vertebrae. And then I've embellished it with a couple of um, lava beads. We can go to the next slide. Do I have another question down here? Let me double check. Oh, okay. And so this basket here is made from natural, what kind of beads? Uh, lava beads. This basket here is uh, made starting, uh, the beginning of the coil is from a slice of a black walnut. I really love trying to keep my batch baskets in a natural shape, but every now and then I get a little wild and dye them and uh, experiment. But this one is made with natural pine needles, the natural black walnut slice, and then my uh, binding thread is raffia. Raffia comes from the, uh, the fron palm fronds from uh, Madagascar, Africa. 
And then I've embellished this one with a couple of um, alder cones and just a, a little fancy bead there. Next slide, please. So there are a variety of pine needles. And the little grove of pine needles on the left there is ponderosa pine, which is the most common that you will find here in Washington state. This little grove of pine needles, pine trees here, the ponderosa pine is uh, from my neighborhood here in Kent, Washington. Generally, mostly the ponderosa are more prominent on, on the eastern side of our state. The variety of the pine needles on the upper right there uh, on the farthest left is the ponderosa pine and they're usually in length anywhere from seven to ten inches long and the, the variation of the length is um, its placement on the tree and its growing envir environment. The next one over is um, some naturally green longleaf pine needles and these are usually from the southern states North Carolina, Georgia, Florida and you can order those off of the internet if you're not um, able to travel to those states. The next one over, the third one over to going to your right is natural longleaf pines. The one after that is a glycerin treated um, longleaf pine and the reason we treat them with glycerin is it makes the pine needle a little more pliable. And that's done in a, a little cooking bath. And the glycerin you can find at most drugstores. It's also what they use to make soaps from. The black pine needles I've dyed with Rit dye with a little bit of glycerin in that bath. And then the next one is uh, red Rit dye. So you can use natural or you can uh, color them up and create a design and uh, you can go from there. On the lower uh, right there, um, this is a, co I'm coiling the pine needles here. And what a coil is, is simply a bundle of pine needles. So you need to attach your new bundle or coil to your basket coil. I'm stitching with uh, artificial sinew in that picture. And I'm using a stitch called the wheat stitch, which is my favorite. Next slide, please. So I was rummaging through my grandmother's uh, buttons. And so the basket on the left is a button I found in her collection. It's a celluloid button. And it already has those little holes in it there that I use to attach my coil to. I've used uh, dyed black pine needles and black natural and red colored artificial sinew. And then I've embellished the rim with a few seed beads. The basket on the right, I've used natural uh, pine needles with the natural raffia. I've embellished that with a novelty bead and some uh, delica beads. Next slide, please. And then it was time to get a little wild and crazy and um, create some vessels here. So the one on the left, uh, I was at a thrift store and I found this wrought iron candle holder. So I got to looking at that and I thought, hmm, I might be able to make some kind of a cool looking basket with that. So I um, took some artificial sinew and I covered the entire wrought iron holder with um, a buttonhole stitch, which gave me little holes that I could slip my needle into and start coiling along and following the path of the wrought iron. And at the top there where the candle would have set into, I created another little uh, basket to set into that. And then I just embellished it with a little uh, fauceted bead up there. And I named that one Candlelight. The basket uh, vessel on the lower right there was a basket that was going to be taught at our coiling convergence the year it was canceled with the COVID. So hopefully we'll uh, address this class once again, once we're able to meet again. So this is a naturally shed uh, deer antler. And I think it just really uh, complements the antlers really nice. 
And I've just using, used um, a little wooden laser cut disc there and I've backed it with a little piece of leather. And then I uh, actually stitched that one with artificial sinew also. So I think that kind of wraps up my presentation. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, is the antler class advanced? Uh, yeah, I would think that you would need a little bit of coiling experience to tackle that class. I would say yes. And so now I would like to introduce Richard Vogt. Hi, Richard. You need to unmute. Okay. Did, did somebody put me on spotlight? I seem to have lost the ability to spotlight myself. There we go. Okay. Hi, my name is Richard Vogt. I do a slightly different technique and a different material. Uh, I do twining, basketry twining with wax linen. And I'll come back to these two little guys in a minute. Um, uh, twining differs a little bit from plating. Plating that Jill was talking about is really a simple under over technique. It's like cloth. It's like a uh, woven uh, uh, blankets. Uh, there's a, a weavers and there's spokes uh, and the weavers go in and out between the spokes and every other weaver alternates. So one weaver is going behind a spoke and the next weaver goes in front of the spoke. With twining, there's two weavers that are involved and the weavers twist around each other. And, and there's some advantages that- uh, Richard, excuse yeah. me, they, uh, somebody is saying here that they're losing you, losing him. I'm not sure what that means. I don't either. His, his audio was cutting out for a minute, but it seems to be better now. Oh, okay, weak signal. All right, great, All right. thank so, you. Uh, pardon me. So uh, with, with twining, uh, twining differs from simple plating uh, by having two weavers that are involved. And the two weavers twist around each spoke as they go around. Uh, if, if with plating, each weaver pulls the spoke in, in one direction and the next weaver has to straighten out again. With uh, twining, there's a balanced weaving going on and the, the spokes are allowed to be straight. And the advantage of this is uh, creating a more open weave construction, which can be used in fish baskets. These are very old techniques. This is a basket that was made in Martha's Vineyard on the East Coast about 100 years ago um, using beach grass, which you can see in the lower right. And uh, they're bundles of beach grass uh, in, at you being used as the spokes, and these are being stabilized using a twining, this twining technique uh, of, uh, again, uh, beach grass bundled together as, as long fiber. Um, I started making these baskets uh, in the early, I don't know, around 20, around 2002, I guess. Um, and I was making them out of simple jute. Uh, I got these spools of jute and I just thought it made a very interesting uh, texture and structure uh, to make baskets out of this material. It didn't require any water. It was, it was dry. My hands didn't have to be wet. And, and I started exploring these forms and shapes uh, using materials. Um, you have to start the basket somehow. And in the upper left is the bottom, the base of a basket, which is a really a simple plating technique of using bundles of under and over, and then dividing those bundles up using the twining uh, method, which is uh, shown in the diagram in the lower left. And the lower right is the finished basket that has that uh, same base in the upper left. Um, it wasn't long after that that I discovered a couple of things uh, which somebody shared with me. One was I could actually use two colors. Uh, I'm colorblind, so my two colors are usually black and white. Um, and the other thing was, was that depending on how you twist the, the weavers, you can get lines that appear to be going up or down. Uh, and you can see that in the lower right in the diagram. Uh, one of those is being twisted in a clockwise direction and the other one is twisted in a counterclockwise direction. And that the way that the 
fiber lays on the twist, it appears to be going angling down or up. And if you look at the series of baskets, you can see that the lines seem to rise or fall. You get little arrows. And this led me into exploring a lot of different geometric forms. Some simple forms that you see here. <clears throat> the material that I use, as I said, is wax linen. It comes mostly from a company uh, called Royal Wood, which imports it from uh, uh, Europe. It's, it's, they're referred to as Irish wax linen. And I, there's a manufacturer apparently in Belfast, which nobody seems to be able to discover. And so it all has to be bought through Royal Wood. There's some American manufacturers of wax linen, uh, but it doesn't come in such varieties. Uh, you can get it in many different colors. You can get it in different sizes. Uh, it comes plied, so you get it between two and 12 ply. So you can have different diameters, et cetera. And you just peel it off the roll and, and, and weave with it. I don't need many tools, a needle, an awl, a pair of scissors to cut the material. And it's, it's quite portable. Um, these are some baskets that I've made over the last few years that have gotten a little bit more complicated. They do a lot of twilling, combine a lot of twilling. Jill uh, explained that twilling is when you're, instead of going under one, over one, you might be going, skipping a couple of, of, of spokes. So you might be going under one, uh, uh, over two. In this case, under one and over two uh, refers to whether you're weaving with uh, the black string or the white string. The black string might be going over two and the white string going over one uh, spoke. Um, but you get quite a different variety of weaving patterns. And I do a lot of these baskets and find them quite interesting in their variety. I also started exploring uh, doing different shapes. I do some uh, uh, lampwork glass uh, as another side project. And I was making a lot of little heads. And I thought, well, these heads are kind of cool. I can make a lot of heads, sort of Natsuki heads. Um, these are you know, a glass stained with some uh, iron oxide to get out the details. And I thought, well, I'll just spend a few hours in the evening and, and whip together some bodies for these, these heads. Well, the bodies kind of took over. And if I could make three or four heads in an hour, it took me like a couple of weeks to make a body. And they got quite involved. Um, and I really enjoyed making, exploring the different shapes and putting arms on them and making little hybrid creatures and, and they all needed names. So I <laughs> sort of arbitrarily came up with names for them. Um, I also sort of, you know, at the same time was exploring different kinds of shapes or more regular shapes and different ways to get patterns, solid patterns into the baskets and, and figures more of a narrative in some cases, or just looking at how I could manipulate these forms and these are a few baskets that I made along those lines. And the, the lower uh, basket is a triple basket uh, where the starts out with the innermost first basket and then continues with a second basket around it and a third basket, but they're all made of a single piece of construction that just gets more elaborate. And uh, <clears throat> sort of closing on this, uh, one of the more recent baskets I made were what I started this little segment on which I <clears throat> named Hector and Pollux for no good reason, which sort of combined this irregular form with faces. I like seeing little faces in the baskets and, and thinking about them as little stumpy little arms, et cetera. And uh, these, these uh, I quite enjoyed making. I think that's the end of my little segment. And now if I can manipulate my screen, I'm going to switch over to, oh, oh sorry, final. I don't, I'm not the only one that uses this technique uh, by any means. Uh, uh, twining with wax linen is quite commonly used. I'm the only person that might be colorblind uh, that's doing it, but uh, other people are fairly monocolor. Uh, a person who uses a slightly varied technique of uh, twining called full turn twining, uh, Pat Cordy Gold uses this technique as a, uh, to create these mosaic patterns of figures and to get a narrative story, uh, uh, much like those pictorial baskets that Jill showed earlier, to uh, uh, say something uh, that's going on and have a story in her baskets. Lois Russell is a magnificent basket uh, uh, weaver who, 
who makes these landscape baskets, which are enormous, can be enormous. And I just look at these as these old paintings of, of fields in the distance. Uh, Anne Coddington is a very monotone, monocolor basket maker who explores shapes as a sort of representational structures, who uh, uh, makes anatomical shapes. And she's, you know, they're, they're translating into some other form or other message than, than, than a simple basket. And uh, Kale uh, Chappelle uh, has been making these, in the last couple of years, these beautiful multicolored structures. It's just uh, really interesting to see his work. He's a quite uh, new basket maker who's just exploded with these magnificent forms and, and using colors to the extreme. So uh, twining is a very satisfying technique and twining with wax linen uh, can be a very uh, satisfying technique. Um, and if I advance this now, I can switch to David, replace spotlight, David uh, Chambers, who will continue talking. Yes. Hi, everybody. This is David Chambers. Um, most basket makers start out learning traditional techniques with traditional materials. But once you get the basics under your belt, it's kind of fun to explore with non-traditional, non-typical materials and techniques. I put a quote on here associated with Picasso with a question mark, nobody really knows, but learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. So I've been having fun with that, with that concept. So when I talk about non-traditional materials, uh, next slide, please. So just some ideas of non-typical type materials and, and where you can find them. And, and the list is endless, but hardware stores, nuts, bolts, ropes, um, tubing, uh, craft stores with ribbon and thread and fabric. And the beading sections are interesting too. You can find all sorts of things there. Office supply stores seem strange, but paper clips, rubber bands, paper, pencils, I've seen some beautiful baskets made out of pencils. Sounds strange, but it's true. And the last one I have on here, an example, is recycling. Um, taking materials that maybe they're you know, no longer needed or going to be thrown out. Uh, repurposing is another maybe name for this. Um, I've seen baskets made from water bottles. Uh, I know a lady who likes to use you know, recycled materials, and somebody's given her a gross a garbage bag full of 3D movie glasses. She hasn't figured out what to do with it yet, but she's thinking about it. Uh, next chart. So what happens when you use you know, different materials? Uh, I'm a coiler, like Vicki. Um, mostly my, I use pine needles. Uh, it's the way I started and I still enjoy using them. But it's fun to go to the store and, and look for other materials. The upper left here, uh, I coiled a basket uh, using vi clear vinyl tubing. And I put a light inside, so now the basket glows. So it's kind of cool. Lower left, a uh, clothesline. And then I got some embroidery floss from the craft store. Uh, I didn't know it was going to look this pretty when I got done. I just thought I would play around. So uh, it was a surprising result. Uh, on the right is probably one of my current favorite materials, steel cable. Uh, coil it just like you know. Uh, just like you do with other materials. Uh, you put this in a bright light and it sparkles like diamonds. So it's really cool. All these materials, um, they have limitations. They have things they can do. They have things they can't do. And you have to respect that to be able to make baskets. The same goes for traditional materials also. Uh, next chart. So I like to spend a lot of time in the hardware store, as you probably noticed on the previous page with those materials. And when you spend a lot of time, you come up with some crazy ideas. So this just shows about how far I've gone these days. Here's a basket made out of steel cable, steel washers, and the bottom of the basket is a sink drain cover. Why not? It's shiny, it has holes that I can use to attach. And when I get done, it looks all nice together. So again, using materials that aren't typical, but they have actually very beautiful results. So uh, next chart, please. So moving on maybe from materials and just talking about non-typical type techniques. 
here's a beautiful basket by Barbara Walker. And she's using what's called ply splitting. There's a detailed picture I have on the lower right that shows what this is. All cordage, string, rope, stuff like that is usually made from separate plies of material that are twisted around each other to form the final result. result. But with ply splitting, you can pull apart those plies and weave through back and forth as it shows in the, in the details. And I think the variations are endless on this type of technique. Personally, I have never taken any classes. I'm a little afraid. I think my mind might explode when I try to think of all the possibilities. Um, next chart, please. David. So, yes. You question. had a question. Um, yes. They wanted to know what the ribs of the steel baskets were made of. Ah, the, the coiled steel basket I had wrapped in brass wire. It's the same material I used as my stitching material. It can be very painful on the hands, but it works. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, some other techniques that aren't that common, but you'll find them around. Here's a basket that Jill took a photo of in a thrift shop. It's called, the technique is called Neolithic braid. Typically when you see a basket, you know, most baskets, you would expect to see spokes that radiate out from the center, kind of like the spokes of a, of a wagon wheel. They go up the sides and then you have weavers that go around the basket weaving in and out of the spokes and that's how everything is held together. But with Neolithic braid, the weavers and the spokes, it's the same material. And it's, it's an interesting technique. I've drawn a dashed white line on this basket to kind of show how it works. You can see on the far left, I have the word spoke there. So here I have a piece of material. It's going up like you, going vertically like you would expect on the spoke of a basket. But when it intersects a weaver, they wrap around each other and change places. So now which was spoke now becomes a weaver. That weaver moves over until it hits the next spoke. Again, they go around each other and change position. Now my, my original spoke was a weaver, now it's a spoke again. So you can see it creates this stair-step pattern across the basket. So tip, not typical what you see on other types of uh, techniques. Next chart, please. So I had originally grabbed this basket as an example of Neolithic braid. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner, I have a, a close-up and put in a dashed red line to show that stair-step effect again. Interesting here, what Teresa has done is her weaver intersects with every third spoke. So it's not every spoke. So here's a, here's a variation on the technique already. One thing I wanted to point out in this basket was the center. And that's why you see the large picture on the left. The center section, the square, if you look at it, the green and yellow material, well, it's over, under, over, under. So it's, it's plated, what Jill was talking about earlier. And then around that, you see five, six rows of very tight weaving, and that's twining. That's what Richard was talking about. And after the twining, this is where Teresa started the Neolithic braid. So this basket's called a Neolithic braid basket, but there's at least three different techniques in this basket alone. And you'll find that in many baskets. It's not just one technique, even though it might be called by one name. Uh, next chart. Then if you just kind of don't want to follow a technique of your own and make it up yourself, uh, here's, here's a basket by Emily DeVoren. She's used refrigerator magnets and fly swatter handles and a few other things, including zip ties. She loves her zip ties. And she's assembled a basket out of these parts. I mentioned earlier the uh, grocery bag, excuse me, the garbage bag of uh, 3D movie glasses. She's the one who got the garbage bag. So if someday in the future you ever see a basket made out of 3D movie glasses, look for Emily's name. It wouldn't surprise me. So next chart. So here's the last basket picture we have for today. Um, this, I just wanted to say there, there's no end to the creativity, the imagination, and the fun you can have with baskets. This is my attempt at a steampunk basket. Why not? Um, the bottom's made out of clock parts. The top part is copper tubing and brass wire. And yes, it's coiled. I love coiling. So why not coil copper tubing? And 
the imagination is just endless here. Gauges, I built my own gauge with my own wording. Why not? You can be as creative as you want. So I guess the final chart, please, Richard. I guess this is a, a shameless plug for our guild, but um, you know we are the Northwest Basket Weavers Guild and you, we have our website there. You can see at the bottom of the chart, nwbasketweavers.org. Um, our guild, we sponsor what we call basket days during the year. Vicki mentioned the coiling convergence. That was one of them. We've been trying to have about four separate events during the year. We pay the teacher's fees. So all the students have to do is pay for the materials and a small class fee. And we usually have at least one beginning class. So it's a good place to come and, and just start. Um, our big event that we have during the year is our annual retreat. And we're all excited because it had been in January. You can see the little postcard at the bottom called Weave in Winter, um, but it's cold, it's wet in January. So we're really happy this year to move it to May. But we just made a decision yesterday. It looks like we may not be having retreat this year due to just COVID restrictions and concerns. But in the future, for sure, we've been doing this for many, many years. Um, our retreat is, it's five days long of classes and events. There's all sorts of classes to take from many different teachers. We usually have a well-known feature teacher to come in and give presentations and teach classes. And there's a chance for auctions, buy material and show off your work. We have a basket gala, as we call it, where we have a gallery of, of uh, an exhibit of baskets that people bring in. It's an amazing collection. The people in the Northwest just surprised me with the just how creative and imaginative they can be. Um, we also do classes at libraries. I think this is probably how this uh, Zoom meeting started out originally is connecting with libraries and asking them, you know, hey, would you like to have like a beginning class for one day and uh, people can sign up and come in. So we still do that. Hopefully we'll be doing it in person sometime soon. And then also we have teach we have many members in our guild that are also teachers. And with our monthly newsletter, we usually list all the classes at the bottom so people can contact and find those people. Um, David, we have another question. Yes. Um, the question is, is there a great book to begin to explore basket weaving that you would recommend? Uh, uh, okay, well. Might be a I'm question a for Jill. Yeah, I, I there are oh, so is many. It for Jill? Coiling. There, there's so many. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's really it's hard to pick out one. Um, and, and they're usually um, on a on a technique too, not not one basket that right. um, covers all areas of basket making. It, yeah, thinking. the list is too endless. Uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> Thanks, David. Go ahead. Um, so anyway, I guess that's all I had. So that was the end of my section. So, you know, maybe any more questions? Yeah, any more questions? You can go explore our website and um, you can email us from that website also if you think of a question that you weren't able to ask during the presentation. Uh, also oh. another, another shameless plug. Uh, our, to join our guild, it's a $25 a year membership fee, so it's not a lot. And we have a library, so we have a cabinet full of basket books that you can mm -hmm. check out and look through and learn from. And just, if you want, just enjoy the pictures. I've done that too. We'll go back over to Anne. Yeah, oh my gosh, you guys, that was so... So inspiring. I definitely, I never have made a basket, but after watching this, all, all four of you, your work's amazing and just really great pictures and information and great presentation. So I look forward to also having you hosting some other in-person events once we all get back to normal here. So I really appreciate your fine work and just your informative presentation. It was fabulous. I think everyone would agree. So I look forward to more.